I am Shay Haddock. I am an associate pastor here on staff. I want to welcome you again to the church this morning. Um, exciting Sunday uh, we got here. In fact, I'm overly excited. So um, let's get straight into it. If you're wondering where Jesus, uh, Jimmy is, though, Jimmy is in Oklahoma right now. He left early this morning. Um, Jimmy is uh, an elder at the church that, uh, that he used to uh, lead at. He was the senior pastor at Hera uh, Church down in Oklahoma, just outside Oklahoma City. And um, the, uh, God called Jimmy and his family up to Overland Park about seven years ago to um, lead and, and to kind of replant this church. And anyways, um, the, the senior pastor, Chris Moikes, um, and uh, his wife, Rachel, are going through a a challenging time. Rachel um, has been diagnosed with terminal ovarian cancer. She's given a few days to live. So um, Jimmy is going down there to be with the family, but also um, primarily to um, facilitate some elder-related uh, responsibilities as they are grieving uh, the loss of Rachel, but also celebrating her life and uh, what God has done through her. And so, uh, in fact, I think it's Rather fitting that we're talking about um, evangelism today, and I'd like to uh, kind of use a little bit of Rachel's story in honor of her life um, to uh, stir our hearts for the Lord this morning. Um, so, um, but that's where Jimmy is, so you, you're stuck with me for one more week. Um, yay. <laughs> that sounded like Kevin Hahn. All right. Um, so, we're talking about evangelism and outreach, right? Um, and so I was shocked this week, uh, not shocked, but I was, well, I was a little shocked. I felt, I had a realization uh, as I was reading through the book of Acts that like, and I was looking at the early church and, and I'm not gonna teach through that, but I, I just wanted to start this by saying, um, like, that's why God like left us here. <laughs> like, what, once Jesus overcame death, right? He, Jesus defeated the grave uh, and rose to life, and his blood paid for our sin that those who would confess upon his name and upon his work on the cross would be saved. Like, that was it, man. Like, you know, the, the most important uh, part of all of human history was done, and, and Jesus' work on the cross was finished, right? That was the last thing that he said on the cross. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, man, why is, why is the church here? Like, why are we still here? You know, like, what are we still doing here? And in light of, of, of even thinking about what Chris and, and Rachel are going through, you know, it's like, like, aside from Jimmy, I don't know anybody else in my life, hardly another man of God as passionate about following the Lord and making disciples as Chris Boyce. And I know that uh, Rachel has been an amazing support system for her husband, um, and they've been faithful to do all that God has called them to do. And you wonder, like, man, why is God calling Rachel home? You know, like, Lord, she's like a dynamite disciple maker, Lord. Like, she, she loves the Lord, and, and she can transform uh, lives of, of other women. And, and God, like, are you sure you want to take that one home? You know, don't you, like, maybe want to take a perhaps a less effective one home? You know, I, I mean, maybe that's just my sinful nature thinking, but, you know, I was thinking those thoughts. Um, but, you know, and God was like, no, man, like, her, her work is done. Like, I'm, he, God's looking at Rachel and going, man, she is, is my faithful servant. Like, I'm ready for her to come home. In fact, I'm, God was like, I'm trying to create a little more room for others to step in and, and grow. Like, if Rachel's not filling that godly, womanly, motherly role for the people that uh, are in her life, somebody else will step into that role. And so God's creating margin for growth. And he is sovereign to do that, right? And God is in control. And we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but nonetheless, um, evangelism is something, it, like, it is the essence of why we're here. Like, it's why the church exists. Like, Jesus wants nothing more out of our lives than for the kingdom, the future of the church, the bride of Christ, to grow and the health of the church after we are all dead here in the flesh and we are alive in spirit with Christ in heavenly places as spoke of in the book of Ephesians. Like, that's what Jesus wants from us. 
is for us to evangelize and to grow. In fact, that's why we're here, and that's why Jesus gave us his spirit, right? He said, don't fear, disciples, apostles. I, you know, I'm going to be with the Father. I'm going to sit at the right hand of God, but don't fear. I'm going to give you the helper, the spirit. He will testify of me, and he will give you power. In fact, Jesus said that the disciples of Christ would do greater things even than what Jesus did. Not that we are greater than Jesus, but Jesus' ministry on earth was roughly four and a half years long, right? The ministry of the church, the disciples, the followers of Christ is, we know, at least 2,000 years old, roughly, right? And so um, the work that God is doing in the church is tremendous. In fact, it is miraculous, right? And so that's one of the first things I want to touch on this morning is the miraculous. Like, when we're thinking about evangelism, we must think in terms of the miraculous. We must think of, we, we, we know that Jesus' whole purpose in coming to the cross and raising from the dead and showing himself to people on earth into commissioning the disciples was to seek and save the lost. The word of God tells us that, and so we know indeed that was Jesus' primary mission. Otherwise, without that, we are all wasting our times here this morning, right? We, we're here to learn and to grow and to understand who we are and who God is and why Jesus came and what we're to do with our lives. Like, if Jesus didn't come to seek and save the lost, then we're all wasting our time. And so, um, but you, we have to understand that, like, um, when Jesus rose from the dead, obviously that was a miracle. When someone gets saved, when a lost person becomes saved, that too is a miracle. You're literally bringing dead things to life. Something that is dead is coming alive. Like, and so what if God asked you to go to your local cemetery? Like, there's a couple cemeteries around town. What if God asked you to go to a local cemetery? He's not asking you to raise the whole cemetery from the grave. He just, one person. Just get one person out of a grave. Well, who would you bring with you? Like, what would you do? What would you say? Like, everybody in this room knows clearly that not one person in here has the power to raise anybody from the, from the dead. Nobody, right? But Jesus does. He can. The Spirit of the living God raised him from the dead, and where does the Spirit of God live? In you, in the believer, right? So in order for us to have any hope of raising anybody from the dead, meaning dead to sin and now alive in Christ, transformation, if there's any hope in a dead person coming to life, the Spirit of God must be present. Like we have to believe in the work of the Spirit and we have to bring that to the table. Uh, and so, but we have to think in terms of like, evangelism is scary because it's like, we are literally raising dead people to life. It would be scary to go to a cemetery expecting to, somebody to jump out of the grave. It would be scary. Like, my grandmother's funeral was two weeks ago, and we were in Texas, and, you know, to honor her life, we had the beautiful service, and I walked by, you know, the, the, the casket, and my grandmother was laying there, and, you know, and the mortician did an amazing job on her. My grandmother looked beautiful, but it was like, I was just thinking in my head, I'm like, she's, that's a dead person, right? Like, she's just dead, like, as dead as dead can be. And, but I know where she is. My grandmother is saved. She loves Jesus. She's dancing with him right now in heaven. And I know she's waiting for me and she's cheering me on. I know she sowed seeds of faith in my life, all of which I'm thankful for. But I just was coming to this realization that like, that's a, just a dead body. Like, it, you know, I mean, there's zero hope of her just jumping out and going, just kidding, you know, like there's no hope of that. Like, it's not happening. You know, there's this hopeless feeling when you're around dead people, um, and so anyway, we need to have, um, <laughs> we just need to have this in mind. I just, the only reason I preach on that is just be mindful um, that it, the, we're dealing with the miraculous, okay, when we're talking about people coming to life. And so uh, in John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the, Jesus is Jesus saying, um, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life, but there are some of you who don't believe. But the, the, the key point there is that it is the spirit who gives life, who raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the, the, 
one of the essential three persons of the Trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the Spirit raised Christ from the dead as Christ was being obedient to the Father. I'm not gonna get into a sermon on the Trinity, but uh, it's important to know that the Holy Spirit is who raised him from the dead, and in our flesh, we can do nothing. We can do absolutely nothing. If you have any, like, like my grandmother, if I were to like pick her head up, you know, or like give her some Pedialyte, you know, or put an IV on her, she's not coming back, right? But if the Spirit of God wanted to raise her up, he, he could, without question. This, so we, we need to think in terms of the miraculous, right? Like in the New Testament, we read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both of them were legalistic. Both of them did not believe that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. But there was a primary difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And some of you guys know the Christian joke. It's kind of a lame one, but it is funny. That the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in anything supernatural. That was the primary difference. And that's why they were sad, you see, right? So it's an old it's kind of, yeah, yeah, that, I didn't make that up. That's an old Christian joke. You know, I'm sure Billy Graham told that one a few times. Um, many before him, too. But uh, nonetheless, it was true, though. They, the Sadducees didn't believe in the miraculous. And I'm telling you right now, the dead people or the legalistic people or the, those who are either a part of the church or not part of the church today, we have lots of Sadducees. Like, we have lots of people that are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the miraculous. Like, they don't actually believe that, that I, I'm, I wonder if they actually believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Like, I, I wonder if they actually believe that God can heal their friend or their mother, or most importantly, speaking of evangelism, that God can save their soul. Like, there's people in our lives that we feel are hopeless or are too far gone, you know, the prodigals ran too far away or whatever. Not, not, none of that is true. We must believe in the miraculous. Abiding. John 15, 5. John 15, pages are stuck. 15, 5. Familiar passage. I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Again, we hear that nothing, nothing. Like when Jesus says nothing, he doesn't mean like you'll be average or like you'll do an okay job. He means when, when speaking of heavenly things, your flesh is of no value whatsoever, period. So anything but spiritual transformation in you, anything but Jesus Christ flowing in and through your life, as people are looking into your life and you're looking into their life, wanting to be used by God so that the kingdom of God might grow, that they would profess faith in Christ and they would grow in Christ. Every ounce of that work that is of kingdom value is of the spirit. And, it, and you're bearing fruit because you're abiding in the vine, right? That's like asking, like I was walking through the woods showing a farm yesterday and I was look, there was a, a client that had done some uh, some tree felling, right? They had laid, laid some trees down doing some habitat management work. And anyway, I was looking at um, these trees and like, you know, there's a certain way that you can cut a tree. It's called a hinge cut. You half cut the tree at a certain angle and it falls over, right? And, but it's still connected on one side as the tree has fallen over, right? So it can still grow even though it's kind of broken. Does that make sense? But then there's other times where the, the, the guy gets a little too aggressive with the hinge cut and he goes too far and when it falls over, it just snaps and it breaks, right? So you're looking at a big tree laying on the ground with the intended purpose that it would be fruitful, that it would grow thicker, right? Provide more cover for the wildlife. And in fact, the tree's dead. You killed it, right? And so um, it's not bearing any fruit, right? It's not connected whatsoever. And so you're looking at this big dead tree going, that thing will never grow a branch. That thing will never produce a leaf or an acorn or anything of any value to this kingdom, right? This animal kingdom. Same is true for us in the spiritual world. Like when we cut ourselves off from Jesus, when we run a little too far from him and we don't abide in him, the tree of our life falls over and we bear no fruit. And nothing grows on us. We think we're a tree and we are, but we're a big dead one adding no value to the kingdom of God. And so we have to keep that 
in mind that uh, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And so we must abide before we go out, before we reach, before we evangelize, before, otherwise, in fact, we'll have no fire whatsoever for Jesus if we're not abiding. We won't be so in love with him that it just overflows onto other people, okay? I want to remind you guys of the story of Moses and how when Moses went up to uh, the mountain to receive the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, right? And some of you guys know the story. Aaron was down here with the, with the Israelites, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, right? And he went up there, and the, the finger, the literal hand of God came and wrote on the tablets of stone, right? And Moses comes back down the mountain after a long journey of being up there with the Lord and this intense moment of fellowship where Moses actually saw the hand of God move and he comes down and he sees the people making a mess, right? They created a golden image and a golden calf and they were worshiping it. And Moses freaks out and he throws the stone on the ground and breaks it. And he actually has to go back up the mountain and ask God for another set, right? And so uh, some of you guys know the story. And uh, I love Moses' heart there, though, where he, he's like, what, 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 what we don't have to do is like the, the benefit for us of having the Spirit of God living in us, indwelling in the believer, is that we don't have to be like Moses. Like, we don't have to go and spend time with God and then come down and broadcast, you know, to dead people and then go back to the Lord for a fresh fill and then come back down the mountain and feed the people again. We don't have to do that. Like, when we're evangelizing, when we are raising a new life up, when we are raising someone up in Christ, we teach them to go up the mountain with us. We take them with us. We say, I want you to show you Jesus. I've seen the hand of God. I've seen the miracles of Jesus. I've seen what he can do in my life. I can see what he's done in others' life. And let me tell you what he can do in your life. Show, let, come on, let me show you. You invite them into your life. You show them how to spend time with Jesus. You show them how to abide. You show them what miracles look like. I don't mean like we're raising people from the dead and whatnot, but I'm talking about uh, you know, like Mike Vaughn's life is a miracle, man. I don't know where, where is my, there he is. It's a miracle. My life's a miracle. Everybody in here is a miracle. Birth itself is a miracle. Physical birth is a miracle, but spiritual birth is even more so, right? And you must be born again, like Jesus told Nicodemus, right? So we must be born twice in order to be saved, amen? So, um, One thing on this is like, I feel like we can be a little bit content with the sermon. We can be a little content with the podcast. We can be a little content with the Bible study or the discipleship group even. Like, uh, you know, we're, we're in kind of just a receiving position. We're like the people at the base of the mountain saying, Moses, feed us. Moses, give us, what did God say? You know, like, uh, well, we would like to get, you guys, to, Jesus wants you to get to a place where you're not just hearing from Jimmy or, or from Shay or from your discipleship group leader or from whoever pastor you listen to every Tuesday afternoon when you have nothing to do at work, whatever. He wants you to know, like, God, he wants to say something to you, you know? God is saying something through me to you today in a church service where we gather and hear from the Lord, and that's all biblical, and amen to that. I'm thankful for that. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I think at times we, we were too content to just be in a receiving position. Like, we're too content to say, oh, man, my cup is full. On so and, man, yeah, she brought the word, man. That was really awesome. My cup is full for the rest of the week. No, it's not. It is not full. You have to fill that cup up every day, and that's why abiding is so important. That's why going up to the mountain yourself to be with the Lord is so important, okay? So don't get too complacent. And, and, and allow um, yourself to, to be victim to, to that type of behavior. The other thing is, Francis Chan had a good quote. I really like this. Some of you guys know Francis Chan. He's a pretty inspirational uh, pastor out west. And anyway, he says, a movement starts when the founder really knows Jesus. Movements die when the followers only know the founder. And I, I, I love that. Like, I think that just brings home the point that I'm trying to make. Like, 
if, if your guys' life, if, you're, if your walk with Jesus um, is, is, is really the extent of it is hearing me or Jimmy on a Sunday or listening to like one sermon a week on a podcast, you know, you're, you're, you're dying. You're like spiritually withering. Like you're, you're like a branch that was bearing fruit. You've been like hinge cut and you're partially bearing fruit, okay? Um, so guard yourself uh, from that. Unity. Unity is really, really important. Jesus said in, in John 17, verse 20 through 21, Jesus is praying for the believers. He's praying for us, and he says this, I don't pray for these alone, speaking of them right in front of him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. Listen to the unity. They may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one, excuse me, one, of, uh, one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Like, you hear this, unity is extremely important. Like, I believe that the gospel will go forth the more you, the, more, the gospel will go forth more the more unified the church is. The more unified the church is. And so um, we must guard ourselves from uh, any divisive nature. Like any, um, you know, we need to avoid conflict uh, wherever possible, right? We need to absolutely refrain from gossip, right? This is why I was reminded when we had our new members gathering last weekend at the Holbrook House, I was sitting there listening to Jimmy go through some of um, what we believe in and some, you know, um, installments of, of why, why we're a church. Uh, what did Jesus say about the church? Why do we have membership? You know, why can't I just come and like sing and listen and throw money in the plate and go home? Why, why can't I do that? Because there's a level of accountability that God is asking of us as the church. Um, and, and so, um, that in, and unity is important. And like one of the things in the new member gathering uh, that we talk about is like, uh, these are simple things, but important, but like avoiding gossip. Like when you become a member of the church, you're committing to not gossip. Like that's your commitment. You're, you're saying, I know that is of the enemy, like, I'm not saying that everything's going to be perfect, but if there's something um, that needs to be talked about, I'm going to address it in a godly way. And we say, well, you're acknowledging that gossip is ungodly, you know, and that it's divisive. And so, and that's the aim of the enemy. The enemy wants to come in and sow seeds. Like, the enemy sees God moving in this church and in this body. And as we are committing to going and making disciples, like Jesus said, we're preaching the word of God. We're sowing seeds of righteousness in people's lives like the devil wants to come in there and mix that up. And so um, just protecting unity is extremely important. Now, I'm going to start to lead us into, and I'll, and I'll move through this fairly quickly, but this is really important. I think these are, as I was reading through the book of Acts, like I said, I took notes uh, on this, and these, this is important. So these are six, this is not in your bulletin, but you can take notes on your own if you like. Otherwise, you can listen to the sermon later in the week and take notes then. Purity, purity, like kind of what I was just talking about it, um, uh, with like, you know, w w when you commit to be a member of the church, like you're, one of the things you're committing to do is not gossip, right? I'm just giving that as an example. But um, one of, there's six essentials to evangelism, and one of those is purity, purity. Um, holiness validates the message that you're sending, like, if you're gonna pre if you're gonna preach the word, if you're going to share the message of hope, if you're going to deliver the gospel, like you must be living it yourself. Not perfectly, none of us do. But you know, like Jimmy talked about a few weeks ago, whether your heart is postured towards the Lord or postured towards the world. Okay, if you're postured towards the Lord, then you will be bearing fruit, and people will know that. They will see Christ in you, they'll know that it's genuine, they'll feel the power of the Spirit in you, okay? But purity is important, like your own personal walk with Jesus is a direct reflection to what degree you are a evangelized, to what degree you share your faith. If you personally walk with the Lord, you abide in him, you're on fire for him, his spirit is in you, you nurture that every single day, you take your cross up, 
daily. You lay your life down. He, Jesus, is raised up in you daily, and you can confidently say to yourself that you are living an honorable, godly life upright before a holy God. Like, then you will be naturally evangelistic because it will come out of you. You can't help it, okay? And whenever it is shared, whenever the faith that God has put in you is shared outward, evangelized, the gospel is presented, people will know that it's authentic and they'll know that it's real and it will be received. People know when the gospel is presented from a fake person. Don't be fake, Christian. Like Jesus said, pluck your, you know, put your finger in your own eye and, and pluck the plank out of your eye before you dig into somebody else's. And hear me clearly on this. In order to share the gospel, you have to talk about sin. You have to talk about sin, okay? Like, in order to lead somebody, like, like Mike was saying, man, I was dead to sin, and I got raised to life. Jesus set that man free from some stuff, and I'm like, it's amazing. But like, how did he get there? We talked about sin, okay? You have to do it. That's why Jesus died. His blood paid for our sin. You, you cannot talk about Jesus. You can't talk about the gospel. You can't share the truth without talking about that. And so that's why Jesus said, pluck the plank out of your own eye first before you dig into someone else's. Because if you're evangelizing, you are digging into someone else's eye. You have to tell them their sin separates them from God. I think we miss that. I think we miss that. Today's church is so soft. It's so soft, man. We're scared to tell people that it's their sin. It's my sin. My sin nailed Jesus to the cross. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm, I'm, I'm preaching here, but that's what I'm called to do. I mean, it's like, right? I, I don't understand. You, you, you cannot share the gospel without talking about sin. You're, you'll never lead in. You'll, they'll never get free. You just, anyway, okay. Wow. Okay. Moving on. All right, power. So the first one, Oh, I'm sorry, the second one is power. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Spirit comes. The day of Pentecost, right? The day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God fell, and they were, they, the, they were empowered, right? When Peter spoke on Solomon's porch, he led 3,000 people to Christ the first day the church existed, right? Like, we should believe in the power. Like, and not only should we believe by faith, it's documented, like, it's a history, it's in history. Like, it was recorded. This is a historical fact that this happened, that the Spirit of God came upon them, and, when, and, and they spoke, and they heard each other in their own languages. It was a miraculous event. This is a recorded event in history. So it's not like we have to believe in faith that that actually happened. It's history, you know? And so it's been validated that the power of God has been manifested upon mankind, the Christian faith is the only faith, it's the, it's the only uh, spiritual engagement that has anything to do with validating the miraculous. Like if you investigate anything else, I don't care what it is, Islam, uh, Mormonism, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. But if it's anything other than the Bible, man, it's fake. And it wasn't true and it didn't happen and it's like, you know, uh, and if it did, it wasn't of the Lord. And so uh, just, just have confidence in the power of God, because it's in the word. It's documented. And so um, I remember uh, reading in Acts that even uh, people believed that even the shadow of Peter could save. We did, it, it doesn't say that, that, the, that Peter's shadow uh, was cast on anyone and, and actually saved them or healed them. But they were so confident in Peter's walk with Jesus, they were so confident that he knew God that even they, they believed that even his shadow, like they tried to position themselves in Peter's path so that his shadow would go over them and they might be healed. Like, is, is, is your faith so infectious? Are people so confident of your walk with God that they might even believe that your shadow might save them, right? I'm, it's a figure of speech, but it's, it's, uh, it's powerful. Persecution is the third P. Persecution, expect it, embrace it, and use tact, right? What did we say last week was tact? Tact was the ability to make a point without making an enemy. 
You have to use tact. And so when you're preaching the truth, when you're sharing about sin and when you're sharing about hope, when you're sharing about what God has done and the miraculous event that it is that Jesus was risen from the grave and you too have an opportunity to be raised to life, you you must expect that not everybody's gonna receive it. In fact, there's gonna be some people that hate you for it. There's gonna be some people that hate you for it. I personally have not experienced persecution to the degree that Paul did or that Peter did, but I have absolutely experienced persecution experienced persecution in my life, in my faith. Like, I'm telling you, when you speak on sin and heaven and hell, and when you actually speak the truth of God's word, there's a lot of people that don't agree. And you know what's funny? Most people that are the most combative are are rogue Christians. They are fallen away Christians. Whether they're saved or not, I don't know. But they don't actually believe in scripture And that's where most of the division comes from. That's why unity in the church is so important. But persecution, expect it. Jesus' teaching is convicting. That's why the Sadducees and the Pharisees hated him. Because he he was convicting. And so too is the gospel. The gospel is convicting. To evangelize is to preach sin to self-righteous people. We are all self-righteous. We are. And the more we lay our lives down and confess our sin before Jesus, the more we realize that (laughs) we are, right? And that's part of the growth process. We must be persistent. That's the fourth P. Proverbs says that the righteous are as bold as a lion and uncompromising the mission, not aiming to please men, but, but God. Like, just be persistent. Not, a, a, not like Paul says, a, a clanging cymbal or a gong. Remember, it must be spirit-led, but let the spirit lead you. Don't quench the spirit either, right? There's balance. Providence is the fifth P. What God can and chooses to do is outside of our control. I have family members that I want God so badly to save, and they have not confessed faith in Christ yet. I so badly wish that my mother would give her life to Jesus. I mean, lay it down. My mother would tell you she believes in Jesus. I I know that she's not saved. There's no fruit on the tree. She's not born again. I so badly want God to save my mom. But he is God and I am not. And I must trust in the work of the Spirit in her life that in the right time, in the right day, in the right season, when she does realize that Jesus died for her, it will be real. It will be authentic, and God's power will move through her life at that time. So I have to rest in the providence of God and the sovereignty of God. We must be honest about our input, not about our outcome. We're not in the outcomes business, but we are in the input business. We must be honest with the input that we're giving God, trusting in him with the outcome. Prayer is the last one. Like, need I say more? Like, the prayer of the righteous avails much, right? We've got to pray. If there's people in your life that you want to reach and believe in miracles, believe that they are going to go from death to life, we must pray them into the kingdom. Okay? I'll leave you with these takeaways. These should be in your bulletin, I think. Maybe. When Christians are united, lost people believe. I want to read real quick in Philippians 1. Philippians 1, 27 through 28. It says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Key word there, striving together. And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them just a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that is from God. When Christians are united, lost people believe. When we gather together in sincerity, in unity, and we all collectively believe in the mission of God and what he's called us to do, other people see that and they are saved. Number two, it's the spirit of the Lord that saves, not intellect, okay? Uh, like we're not here teaching you guys how to be more intellectual, you know, or even a, more apologetic. 
or to know more about the scripture. The biggest lie in the kingdom right now, I, this is an opinion, not a fact, but is that, that you have to know more about the Bible to share your faith. Like that is such a tactic of the enemy. Like can we get over that? That's elementary. That, that, that is like the devil, right jab, right jab. And I see so many you know, people are like, I need to know more about the word. I need to know more about the Bible. That is true. Those are true statements. But if, you're, if you've got a mouthpiece put on you for that reason, you're just letting the enemy pop. You're like, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I mean, he's just nailing you, man. Like, just dodge that one. Just dodge that one, okay? You don't need to be a theologian to share your faith. Peter, like, let it rip on day one when he was filled with the Spirit and 3,000 people got saved. Okay, like I believe that could happen. And so, number three, I said this earlier, we're trying to raise the dead. Like we're trying to raise the dead. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. We're trying to raise the dead here. Like if you believe in the word, you believe that, that those who are in sin and, and, and have not been covered by the blood of Christ are dead. So we need Jesus. And then and the last one is abiding is providing. Abiding is providing. We talked about Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me and you will bear fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That is so true. Abiding is providing the fuel for your evangelistic heart. If you have no fuel, if you have no desire to evangelize, but you tell people you love Jesus or that you're saved, try abiding. Get back connected to the vine. Spend time with Jesus that you might bear fruit. I promise you, man, you will start to have a heart for lost people. You will. You will start to want to share your faith, man. You won't be able to contain it. Like Jeremiah said, man, the word of God is in me like a fire shut up in my bones. I tried to contain it, but I cannot. That you will feel like that when you are abiding. And the big idea is Jesus reached out. Have you? Jesus was the ultimate evangelist. How did he reach out? He came down from heaven to be born in a stinky manger, to be born of a human, a woman, to live a life ridiculed, thrown off the cliffs in Nazareth, mocked by the drunkards. He, he was asked to go all the way to the cross like for you and me, like it's safe to say Jesus reached out. His outreach was strong. And so like are you, does your life replicate that? 